a very good evening to all the attendees who have joined uh, for this special public lecture by Professor Randy Schiffman, a Nobel Laureate Physiology Medicine 2013, and who is also the Howard Hughes Institute Investigator and Professor of Cell and Development Biology, University of California, Berkeley. And a very good morning to Professor Randy also. It's around eight o'clock uh, at his place. And I would like to thank him for kindly accepting our invitation to give this special public lecture, which is jointly organized by the National Academy of Sciences, India Delhi Chapter, and the Science Foundation and Ministry of Education Institution Innovation Council, situated at Deen Dialupadhyay College, University of Delhi. Under the ages of the Department of Biotechnologies uh, Star College program. So, before inviting uh, uh, Professor Shakman to deliver his talk, I would like to give a brief introduction about Professor Shakman and his achievement to all the attendees. He was born in St. Paul, Minnesota at the end of 1948, but grew up in California attending the Western High School in Anum and gaining his BA in Molecular Science at UCLA in 1971. Initially intending to pursue a medical career, he was instead inspired by a year working in a laboratory at the University of Edinburgh and returned to America to study biochemistry at Stanford under 1959 Nobel laureate Arthur Kornberg, gaining his PhD in 1975. He first became interested in how the proteins move within the cell during a postdoctoral fellowship with John Singer. But at the time, it was difficult to study vessels in mammal cells in the laboratory. So moving to the University of California, Berkeley in 1976, he decided to use yeast, a one-celled microorganism, which could be easily genetically manipulated, yet has a cell structure similar to those of higher organisms, including humans. Gradually, he unpicked the mechanics of vessel formation, selection of protein cargo and movement to the correct path outside the cell, and identified 50 genes involved in the process and the order and role each played. One of the most important genes he found, he says, is the SEC61 gene, which encodes a channel to allow secretory proteins to pass into the endoplasmic reticulum lumen. When this gene is mutant, proteins fail to enter the secretion assembly line, causing diseases in humans that may include Alzheimer. He was promoted to associate professor in 1982 and professor rank in 1984. In 1991, he was named as a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and is also a foreign member of the Royal Society, the National Academy of Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. He is also devoted to the promotion of science in an open manner as possible. He's a former editor-in-chief for Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And in 2011, he was appointed as the editor of eLife, an open access journal published by the HHMI, Max Planck Society and the Wellcome Trust. When he won the 2013 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, he devoted the prize money to the creation of an endowment for the Easter and Wendy Schickman Chair in Basic Cancer Biology at the University of California, Berkeley. Both his mother and sister, after whom the post is named, had died of cancer. With these words, I now invite Professor Shachman to kindly deliver his talk. Thank you very much. I appreciate those uh, kind remarks. And I welcome uh, all of my friends in India, where it is uh, later in the evening even though it's uh, still early here in the morning. So uh, you are uh, more than 12 hours ahead of us. So I, I hope uh, um, that you can remain awake for the next hour while I tell you um, about our work. I'm going to talk in the introduction about uh, the development uh, of the field of membrane traffic in animal cells. I'll tell you a little bit about the history and the basic important questions and then I'll introduce the approach that we used using genetics and eventually biochemistry to understand how vesicles can be formed uh, and how proteins are sorted uh, as they move along the secretory pathway. 
So let me begin with a, a very important cell that has informed much of cell biology. Uh, this is uh, initially the pioneering work of Dr. George Pilati, who was a most prominent membrane cell biologist who used the pancreas uh, for his, as his primary tool to investigate the mechanics of protein secretion. This is a particular cell in the pancreas. It's called the beta cell of the islet of Langerhans. As I'm sure many of you know, this cell is responsible for the uh, coordinated regulated secretion of insulin. And indeed, insulin is stored in these cells within membrane bounded granules. Uh, the insulin can form a virtually crystalline dense uh, core within the granule. But there are many stages that Pilati revealed that precede the packaging of insulin into these granules. The basic problem in eukaryotic cells, indeed in all growing cells, is uh, all of the proteins that a cell makes are manufactured by ribosomes inside the cell. In the case of a human cell, that can be around 23,000 different proteins. Um, it's fine for those that remain in the cytoplasm to do what they are required to do, but for those that have to be exported outside of the cell, molecules like insulin, uh, a machinery has evolved over 2 billion years to allow those proteins to be specifically recognized and encapsulated within a membrane for secretion outside of the cell. Now, let me take a step back further to introduce to those of you who are not uh, familiar with this subject, uh, the basic unit of membranes in a cell. Uh, this is a picture on the left of a thin section electron micrograph, such as you saw in the previous slide, showing the two track arrangement of membranes and a model that was developed in the mid 1970s by, by my postdoctoral advisor, Jonathan Singer, Singer uh, called the fluid mosaic model, which describes the organization of proteins and lipids with respect to each other and uh, gives the, um, the strong impression, which has been borne out by experiment, that these molecules are free to diffuse laterally within the plane of a bilayer of membranes consisting of um, two leaflets, each of which is constituted by phospholipid molecules that have polar head groups and hydrophobic apolar fatty acid side chains. These are arranged in a bilayer so as to optimize the apolar interactions within the middle of the bilayer, and then to allow hydrophilic uh, interactions with the cell exterior or the cytoplasm of the cell. There are of course many membrane proteins that impart unique functional qualities to membranes, That's many of which span the bilayer. They are enzymes uh, and sometimes channels, permeases, or cell surface receptors. Now, in the case of the pancreatic beta cell, uh, one of the mo more important um, functions that's necessary to allow a cell to organize itself is the process called membrane fusion. And this happens most dramatically in the beta cell when a mature granule containing insulin migrates to the cell surface when a cell is triggered for secretion of insulin, the membrane surrounding the granule comes very close to the cytoplasmic surface of the plasma membrane. And at a key regulated point, these two membranes merge by membrane fusion, resulting in a continuous plasma membrane, but topologically with the ejection of the internal content of the granule, in this case, the insulin crystal dissolves and eventually is distributed into the bloodstream. Now, membrane fusion is a very important step that's repeated in almost all cells in our bodies and in all eukaryotic organisms. Uh, another essential aspect of membrane fusion uh, can be captured by the role of nerve cells in communicating signals that come down through the nerve cell called an action potential that uh, triggers a membrane fusion event that results in the secretion uh, of chemical neurotransmitters, molecules like dopamine or serotonin or, acetyl, uh, or uh, acetylcholine. These neurotransmitters then once fused, diffuse to the opposing cell, in this case, it's a muscle cell, which triggers another action potential about that cell 
causing muscle contraction, or in the case of neural connections in the brain, the presynaptic membrane makes contact with other nerve cells to generate a network of information that can be passed specifically uh, from cell to cell. So this process of membrane fusion is terribly important. Now, Dr. Pilati, whom I introduced at the outset, was a, truly a brilliant man and, and his pioneering effort, largely when he was at the uh, Rockefeller University in New York, was to perfect the techniques that biologists could use to preserve tissues and cells so as to allow their inspection in the intense electron beam of the electron microscope seen here. Uh, before that, it was not possible to look at biological materials because they would vaporize in the intense electron beam. But he found ways of fixing the cells, of dehydrating them and embedding the cells into a plastic resin, which could then be cut very finely with a diamond knife to achieve very thin sections that would uh, survive the electron beam and allow dense particles to be distinguished from blank spaces in a cell uh, that, that you see in a typical electron micrograph. So he was a, really a brilliant man. He used this technique and the technique of membrane fractionation where one isolates different membranes from cells to explore the stages in the migration of proteins like insulin as they are made on ribosomes through a network of membranes eventually for secretion to the cell surface. And I'm summarizing a great deal of his work here in the form of a cartoon that shows a pathway uh, whereby proteins like insulin are made by ribosomes bound on the cytoplasmic surface of a membrane called the endoplasmic reticulum or ER. These proteins then fold in the interior of this organelle, which is a, an elaborate uh, network within cells, particularly those that are making secreted proteins uh, more or less full time. Uh, these proteins that are inserted into the interior, the lumen of the ER are then sorted for capture into small vesicles that bud from the ER and deliver their content by fusion to another membrane called the Golgi apparatus. And from there, proteins are modified and further sorted from one another, some like insulin to be packaged into granules that bud from the Golgi and deliver their content by fusion to the cell surface and others sorted from those destined for secretion are delivered to the lysosome, which is the intracellular kind of digestive or, uh, organ of a cell. It's filled with hydrolytic enzymes that are responsible and very, indeed very important for the turnover of macromolecules that the cell wishes to dispose of. Well, this pathway was developed and uh, appreciated by the time I became a postdoctoral fellow. And uh, in 1974, when Dr. Pilati won his Nobel Prize, I had the um, memorable um, uh, event of uh, sitting through his Nobel lecture, a version of which he delivered uh, at a meeting of the annual American Society for Cell Biology then held in San Diego. And uh, although the evidence that he had was overwhelming and the picture be quite beautiful, what struck me having been trained as a biochemist uh, in the laboratory of Arthur Kornberg that we knew very little about the mechanics of this process. That is, we knew essentially nothing about how these proteins pass through a membrane, how they become packaged into a vesicle, how the vesicle knows where to go uh, to fuse with a target membrane. Indeed, in 1974, at the peak of his career, uh, it, uh, it struck me that not a single molecule was known uh, that participated actively in this process. And so when I began my own career two years later, as an assistant professor at the University of California, Berkeley, I decided to explore the mechanics of protein secretion using a simple eukaryotic organism, uh, baker's yeast. Um, baker's yeast shown here, as you might see growing on the surface of a, of a grape, uh, grows by a budding mechanism. Uh, cells at the beginning of a cell division cycle send out a small bud, and this bud grows during the next 90 minutes or so until a cell is ready to divide. So in simply inspecting these cells, it was obvious to us at the outset that new membrane added under the cell wall uh, must grow locally. And perhaps it grows by a process that involves a mammalian style of protein secretion. 
Now, I show pictured on the left uh, a um, painting of Charles Darwin. Uh, Darwin did not work on yeast, but uh, the point I wish to make is that in the years since uh, yeast became a popular organism for e experiments to try to understand how cells grow and divide, it became clear by the mid 1970s, just as I was beginning my independent career, that yeast genes involved in fundamental processes, intracellular processes, were shared with the human uh, counterpart gene. Indeed, it was possible to exchange a human gene uh, into a yeast cell with a defective gene that blocked a process of cell division and allowed that cell to grow with the human gene in place of the yeast gene. So two billion years of evolution have uh, preserved the fundamental mechanics uh, that evolved long ago to execute this enormously complex pathway. And therefore, it seemed uh, obvious to me, uh, not so much to the granting agencies that I sought for funding, but nonetheless obvious to me, that yeast would be a perfect model organism to study this complex process that Pilati had studied essentially with mammals. Now, one of the virtues of using yeast uh, and uh, was already well established by the time I began, is the fact that uh, you can use a simple genetic approach. You can isolate mutations that compromise essential cellular processes. If you delete such genes, of course, the cells will just die and there's nothing to work with. But you can study essential genes by introducing mutations randomly into the yeast genome and follow that by looking for cells that are conditionally growth defective. For instance, cells that grow at room temperature, but fail to grow at human body temperature, 37 degrees. Those mutations often are produced by single amino acid substitutions in a protein molecule, such that the protein becomes thermally unstable. It unfolds when the cells are warmed to a high temperature, but may refold when the cells are returned to a permissive temperature. So temperature sensitive lethal mutations are very useful, very important in defining essential genes and studying the consequence of their absence. Now here's back to uh, what, what struck us. This is a thin section through a yeast cell, a wild type yeast cell, such as uh, one saw it with the pancreatic beta cell, but with much less activity seeming to go on. Uh, yeast cells are packed wall to wall with ribosomes, these dense particles in the cytoplasm. Yet there are organelles, this is a section through what is called the vacuole, which is the yeast equivalent of a lysosome. There are tubules or sheets of endoplasmic reticulum membrane, typically found just underneath the plasma membrane. In other sections not shown here, uh, yeast has a nucleus, a typical eukaryotic nucleus with an envelope and the Golgi apparatus, not as well developed as in mammalian cells. But what was particularly interesting to my group at the time with a wonderful beginning graduate student by the name of Peter Novik was the presence underneath the bud part of the cell, the part that grows during much of the cell division cycle of a cluster of vesicles. These are vesicles that likely are involved in secreting proteins to the cell wall but to us, it also seemed logical to imagine that the membrane surrounding these vesicles could be the building block for the assembly of the plasma membrane. Thus, by a process of membrane fusion, step by step, one could enlarge the bud surface, allowing a daughter cell to grow and mature. Now, the consequence of that simple prediction is that genes required for the production uh, of these vesicles for their movement, for their fusion at the cell surface uh, would be lethal. And thus we look for temperature sensitive lethal mutations. At around 1978, uh, in the early part of 1978, Peter Novick had established the first such mutant called SEC1, short for secretion one, first gene temperature sensitive mutants caused two different secreted enzymes to accumulate inside the cell instead of being secreted to the outside of the cell. And at the time we first obtained this mutant, Dr. Pilati visited UC Berkeley for uh, a special lecture. And the graduate students greeted uh, Dr. Pilati for, with a dinner where 
Peter Novick described his initial results. And Pilate said, well, now, of course, you must inspect your mutant by thin section electron microscopy. We were, of course, going to do this. But Peter rushed ahead and did this. And several months later, he called me down excitedly to the electron microscope room in the basement of our building to show me the following image, by example, of this mutant where the cells had been incubated for a couple of hours at 37 degrees. And the consequence of a failure of growth was the accumulation of thousands of vesicles filling the entire cytoplasmic compartment. When these cells are returned to a permissive temperature, room temperature, these vesicles are mobilized, discharge their content, and the cell can resume growth. Well, over the course of the next um, year and a half, we isolated several hundred additional mutants and defined quite a complex pathway of genes that organize the secretory pathway in yeast, much as Pilate had demonstrated in mammalian cells. Here is a cartoon from around the mid 1980s of our pathway. Uh, the events are very similar uh, to those described in mammalian cells where traffic is mediated by vesicles flowing from the ER to the Golgi and from the Golgi to the cell surface. But importantly, each step in this pathway can now be defined by genes, a number of different genes each protein product of which must execute a special function in relation to the traffic step, uh, step. We discovered genes required for the initial transfer of a secretory protein across the membrane into the lumen of the ER. We, we discovered genes required for vesicle budding and for vesicle fusion. And two former postdoctoral fellows took with them a project to explore the genes required for this event in traffic from the Golgi to the yeast equivalent of the lysosome, the vacuole. So it's an enormously genetically complex pathway. And yet, as I indicated at the outset, this pathway is fundamentally conserved evolutionarily. These genes, all of these genes are found in the mammalian genome. At the time uh, we made this discovery in the early 1980s, the biotechnology industry was growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I cooperated with one company to uh, engineer yeast strains to express and secrete large quantities of import, clinically important human proteins, such as human recombinant insulin. And now, many years later, roughly one third of the world's supply of human recombinant insulin used to treat diabetic patients is manufactured by fermentation in large vats, such as you see here. Now, our work was always very basic in nature. I wasn't really... Uh, all that interested in my lab and exploring how this technique, these observations may be exploited. But the biotech industry was quick to use this information, uh, much with my encouragement. And now we have many different protein products that can be made using the basic knowledge acquired with yeast genetics. Now, of course, we had the genes. We, know, we knew the sequence of the genes. We knew that there were mammalian equivalents of these genes, but the genes at first, had no instructive value. They were, they were simply a stretch of many amino acids, not telling us that all that much about the function of the proteins. So we wanted to develop a biochemical approach that would allow us to uh, understand the function of these proteins, allowing us to isolate the proteins by traditional techniques of protein fractionation. Uh, in order to set the stage for that, we did some more exploration to discover among the genes that are required for the traffic of proteins between the ER and Golgi apparatus, there are two subsets. Those, those that are required, shown here, for the formation of vesicles by a budding reaction, and those that are required for the docking and fusion of these vesicles at the Golgi apparatus, those shown here. Now, interestingly, uh, we, on cloning these genes, were able to show in comparison to the work of James Rothman, then at Stanford University, that these two genes, yeast sec 17 and sec 18, encode the equivalent of two proteins that he had recently isolated called NSF and alpha SNAP, proteins that are required for vesicle fusion in the Golgi apparatus. And so not only did we know that these genes were evolutionarily conserved, but they served a similar function in membrane fusion. Now, Armed with this uh, observation, we studied the formation of vesicles using a simple vesicle budding reaction 
uh, pr uh, produced with membranes isolated from broken cells and cytoplasmic proteins uh, also from those cells. We fractionated all the proteins required for that budding reaction and discovered when we mix the pure set of these proteins with ER membranes that uh, the reaction produced a uniform population of small vesicles that were representative of vesicles that travel from the ER to the Golgi. And importantly, all of the vesicles had a kind of a fuzzy electron dense coat surrounding them. Uh, and we know that these coat proteins uh, are represented by the SEC proteins required for the vesicle budding reaction. Here's a higher magnification view. Now, it gives the impression from this image of a kind of a disorganized coat, but on uh, much closer inspection in other laboratories over many years, we now have an atomic resolution crystal structure of each of these proteins. And um, just to show you a low resolution impression, the coat consists of two layers, an inner layer of proteins that touch the cytoplasmic surface of the ER and are responsible for binding and capturing only those proteins that are destined for traffic out of the ER and an outer layer of coat proteins uh, represented here by this magenta impression, uh, which consists of a, a, a network of proteins that forms a polyhedral cage that envelops and pinches a vesicle from the donor membrane. This is a novel coat. We called it COP2. And as uh, I've indicated before, these subunits are evolutionarily conserved and there is an equivalent structure that is also responsible for vesicle traffic from the ER in human cells. Now, at the time we were transitioning uh, from studies on yeast to studies on human cells, and I was contacted by a clinician then at Johns Hopkins University who had a colleague in Saudi Arabia studying a Bedouin family with a defect in one of these proteins, in a defect in the human equivalent of one protein called uh, SEC23, this protein here. There are two copies of that gene in humans. And so one copy can be defective without necessarily killing the patient. Indeed, patients that had a mutation, homozygous mutation, where both copies of that gene were defective, um, showed uh, facial abnormality. They developed cataracts at a very young age and their um, skull is malformed and fails to mature. These patients nonetheless survive. They uh, are compromised, they have brittle bones. And I don't know what their long-term viability is, but they certainly survived childhood. We obtained a specimen of skin cells from one of these children, from one parent, and then compared those cells to normal skin cells, fibroblasts, by thin section electron microscopy in a long-term collaboration with a wonderful morphologist in Geneva by the name of Lelia Orchi. And Orchi took the following image. The top panel shows a thin section through normal skin cells. You see this endoplasmic reticulum tubule with some granular content in the interior of the lumen. Skin cells from a biopsy of one of the parents of parents are carriers, they are heterozygotes. They show no obvious physical malady, they're perfectly healthy, but you can see that even these ER membranes are somewhat distorted. But notably in the skin cells cultured from one of the children, the ER morphology is enormously distorted, huge bloated vacuolated uh, ER tubules. It's remarkable that these cells grow and divide. Indeed, it's really remarkable that these children can grow to maturity. Nonetheless, there is a clear delay in secretion. And we noted in subsequent years that one of the big issues with these cells is a defect in the rate of secretion of collagen, a connective tissue protein, which begins to accumulate quite substantially within the lumen uh, at the expense of its secretion. Well, I'd like to turn now, fast forward many years, to tell you about uh, some more recent experiments that we've done on another aspect of vesicle traffic. This concerns uh, now a, a, a biological issue 
that is faced by really all eukaryotic cells, possibly even yeast, but is more typically studied in metazoans and is particularly important in humans. And I'll tell you uh, about this uh, as the story develops. Beginning about uh, eight or nine years ago, a new graduate student by the name of Matt Shirtliff joined my group, having come to me uh, from a previous experience in a lab that studied cancer, cancer tumor cells. Now, he told me that tumor cells produce vesicles that are exported outside of cells, so-called extracellular vesicles or exosomes. It's not just tumor cells that do this. In fact, many cells do this. All normal cells do this. In fact, these vesicles can be found in our blood in great uh, abundance because they're produced by all the tissues, all, almost all the tissues in our body. Let me tell you briefly what's known about the production of these extracellular vesicles. A subset of these vesicles called microvesicles bud from the plasma membrane and they bud by a process that resembles that used by enveloped RNA viruses like coronavirus or HIV, where in that case, the viral nucleic acid uh, and a nucleoprotein complex formed in the cytoplasm is captured into a bud that pinches from the cell surface producing a virus that can go on and infect other cells. Turns out that you don't need to be infected to do this. All cells do this anyway. They make a population of these microvesicles. Now there's also another pathway that's been invoked for the production of a subset of these extracellular vesicles. And these, extra, these are, are referred to as exosomes. They are produced by a branch of the endocytic pathway. When proteins at the cell surface are internalized into endocytic vesicles, sometimes those proteins are fated for destruction in the lysosome. When that happens, these proteins are delivered to a structure called the early endosome. And when they are bound for destruction in the lysosome, they are tagged with a little peptide called the ubiquitin tag. And that tag is a piece of information that tells that protein to become enveloped in an invagination into the interior of this endosome, resulting in the production of a vesicle that is now free in the lumen of the vesicle. And over time, these structures can build up to create organelles that are referred to as the multivesicular body. That is an endosomal membrane surrounding what may be hundreds or perhaps even thousands of these small vesicles. Now, for many years, the multivesicular body uh, was known to deliver its content by fusion with the lysosome, where the luminal vesicles would be destroyed and their amino acids and sugars and lipids recycled. But over 20 years ago, it was observed that a subset of these multivesicular bodies, instead of being directed to the lysosome, may fuse at the plasma membrane of the cell and discharge these extracellular vesicles to the exterior in the form of a pulse of, of vesicles. Now, uh, for many years, investigators who studied this have had two possible explanations for why these vesicles may be produced. It may be that these vesicles are just another way of getting rid of things. These are vesicles that may have been destroyed in the lysosome, but instead this cell may simply expel them to be picked up by macrophages uh, in our blood for turnover in their lysosome. That's a formal possibility. Uh, but another possibility that's been most intriguing is the possibility that these are carriers of information that may be conveyed to target cells that take these vesicles up and deliver them uh, by fusion with the light with the endosome to expel the luminal content of the vesicle into the cytoplasm of a target cell for changing some metabolic process in that target cell. So this would be a long range mechanism for cell-cell communication involving the transfer of macromolecules from one cytoplasm to the other. Now, in interestingly, when these vesicles were first isolated, um, various teams of investigators found uh, the presence of small RNA molecules within these extracellular vesicles. 
So this is an example of how cells may be secreting RNA. It's not being secreted into the growth medium uh, as a soluble nucleic acid, but it's being secreted in the form of a, of a vesicle, just as an enveloped RNA virus would be shed into the surrounding medium containing its RNA genome. Well, uh, a great deal of effort has gone into describing how these vesicles may function by targeting the cells. This is an active area of investigation in my lab as well, but I'm going to tell you about something that we published not so long ago that describes how these extracellular vesicles specifically acquire uh, several unique small RNAs called microRNAs. Now, uh, over the course of uh, the recent years, we've devised means of fractionating extracellular vesicles to separate them from other things that are secreted or found in growth medium. And we found when vesicles are displayed on a linear buoyant density gradient, that two populations of small vesicles can be resolved. One is of relatively low buoyant density, which we believe corresponds to vesicles that have bud from the plasma membrane. One marker enriched in these vesicles is called CD9. Another one highly enriched is called MFG8. Um, in contrast, a higher buoyant density population of vesicles characterized by a unique disposition of another membrane protein called CD63 is shown here. Now, importantly, many people believed in the past that other ribonucleoprotein particles and RNAs may also be captured into extracellular vesicles. One such marker protein that had been used is the uh, protein involved in maturation of microRNAs called argonaut. Uh, however, although argonaut can be seen in growth medium and sedimented at high speed along with vesicles, it is not in a membrane because it does not float on a buoyant density gradient. It remains at the bottom of the tube when uh, the, the sample is put at the bottom and then overlaid with a gradient. Membranes are buoyant, they float up, but particles, RNA and protein particles remain at the bottom, as is true of a, the enzyme that precedes argonaut, a, nu a nuclease called dicer. So these are not in exosomes, but they are somehow in the growth medium. Now, interestingly, um, we've explored the RNA content of these two vesicles. I'll just summarize this. Um, the low buoyant density vesicles, uh, contain uh, a sampling of various microRNAs, but are not particularly enriched in those microRNAs. Uh, in contrast, the exosomes that sediment at high buoyant density capture a small subset of unique microRNA species that are very highly enriched. One that I'll tell you about in some detail called MIR-122. We estimate to be around a thousand fold enriched in these vesicles. It's not chemically abundant in the vesicles, but it is highly enriched. And that leads us to conclude that the cell has developed, has evolved uh, a quite um, precise means of sorting that microRNA from other RNAs for its capture. Now, it may be that these microRNAs, again, the cell just want, desperately wants to get rid of, and therefore it sorts them for export, or alternatively, the microRNA that's selectively packaged in these vesicles is delivered for a particular purpose to target cells. We haven't figured this out yet, but it's uh, actively being explored. Now I'm going to spend the next few minutes, the rest of my time telling you how we have uh, approached the question of how microRNAs can be sorted. And the way we do this is the way that we've always really pursued our uh, biochemical projects, which is to try to devise a way of reproducing the sorting event using a cell-free reaction. Here is the reaction that Matt Shirtliff first devised in which I'll tell you now was used by a more recent graduate student, Moraima Tomosh Diaz, to study the packaging of MIR-122 into vesicles that form in this uh, cell-free reaction. It's a very simple idea. Uh, here's the thought. If these RNAs start off in the cytoplasm and become packaged into vesicles that bud into the interior of an endosome, there should be a topological change in the distribution of these RNAs during the course of the 
reaction in the cell, but also perhaps a reaction that we could reproduce in a test tube. So what we do is we take a gentle, gently lysed preparation of, of cells, in this case, a breast cancer cell line that secretes exosomes that have a high, highly sorted set of micro RNA molecules. We take this gently prepared lysate and mix them, mix it with a chemical, sem, chemically synthetic form of MIR-122, um, not radioactively labeled. And we also add ATP and we add cytosol because we believe that soluble proteins will be invoked in this biogenesis pathway. The incubation is conducted at 30 degrees for 20 minutes and after which the membranes are centrifuged to collect endosomes. And then these endosomes are treated with exogenous ribonuclease under conditions where RNA molecules that have not become sequestered within the interior of this organelle will be digested and not seen. These membranes are then sedimented again, they're washed to remove exogenous RNAs and the membranes are dissolved in detergent and then subjected to a quantitative PCR reaction to measure the amount of MIR-122. Here are some of the results that Marima obtained. In a complete incubation for 20 minutes at 30 degrees, she uh, was able to find 15% or more of the exogenous MIR-122 becoming uh, packaged in a form that resisted exogenous ribonuclease. If the incubation is conducted without cytosol present, just membranes and microRNA and ATP, the signal is greatly reduced. So some cytosolic proteins are required for this reaction. Correspondingly, if the incubation is conducted without membranes, just cytosol, ATP and microRNA, uh, little but some, a very low level of such protection is observed. Finally, as another control, if the complete incubation is simply held on ice under conditions where membranes can't bend, then nothing is observed. There's no uh, protected sequestered RNA. So that looked good. Um, now, uh, the next obvious thing was to explore uh, the possibility that RNA binding proteins are required in the cytosolic fraction for this incubation to yield this protected signal. In prior work, Matt Shirtliff, work that we published several years ago, showed that a particular RNA binding protein called Ybox1 or YBX1 protein is required in vivo and in vitro for the packaging of a, of a different microRNA in a different cell lysate. So Marima looked at uh, Matt's experiment, repeated his experiment, the microRNA that Matt discovered highly enriched in vesicles secreted by a different cell line uh, called MIR-223. That RNA is packaged very, again, very efficiently in a complete incubation. Um, but when the YBX1 protein is deleted from the cells that are used to prepare membranes and cytosol, these cells still grow and divide, but that cytosol is essentially inert in packaging MIR-223. This is simply a repetition of what, what Matt had done and published. And similarly, control experiments where the sample is held on ice show little or no signal. Now, importantly, and quite interestingly to us, Marima uh, repeated the experiment with fractions obtained from Matt's wild type and mutant cell, mutant YBX cell. And she found that she could package MIR-122 in membranes and cytosol prepared from that cell. In that case, it's a cell line called HEC-293. Um, it's not as efficient, but it could be packaged. But importantly, very importantly, she showed that cytosol obtained from the YBX1 deleted cell, that cytosol being completely inactive for the packaging of MIR-223, is nonetheless reasonably active in the packaging of MIR-122. So already with just two different microRNAs being secreted in two different cell lines, we have evidence to suggest that yet another, possibly another RNA binding protein may be required for the packaging of this microRNA. So that encouraged Marima to do another experiment that Matt had done to discover the role, a role for YBX1. And that is um, a simple incubation just as before 
But in this case, where the microRNA that's added exogenously contains a biotin tag at its three prime end, the tag then can be used to pull the RNA out of a lysate to capture any RNA binding proteins that had come along during the incubation. So the incubation is conducted as before. The membranes are sedimented, washed, treated with ribonuclease, et cetera. The membranes are then dissolved in non-ionic detergent and the remaining uh, soluble material is mixed with streptavidin beads. Strep the streptavidin will bind biotin and thus bind MIR-122 and bring along any proteins attached to the RNA onto these beads. The beads can, be can then be washed and then proteins that were bound can be removed uh, and evaluated by uh, mass spec to identify the proteins that came along bound to MIR-122. Now, Marima found three different uh, fairly prominent RNA binding proteins that are found in the nucleus of a cell. They are nucleolin, uh, lupus la, first discovered as an antigen in the disease, lupus, and another one called nucleophosmin. Now these, these proteins are encoded by essential genes. It wasn't possible to knock the genes out to produce a viable cell as we had done with YBX1, but it was possible to deplete these proteins by regulated depletion using a variation of the CRISPR technique. And she found most notably that when this protein lupus law is depleted from cells, uh, as the cells die, they uh, decrease measurably the secretion of MIR-122. And as you'll see, they decrease the efficiency of packaging of MIR-122 in the cell-free reaction. So here's a, a, a lovely experiment that has several parts that I'll describe that Morima did. So as before, as I showed you, Morima was able to package MIR-122 in a lysate that contains wild-type cytosol, wild-type membranes, and ATP. And here's a sample of that cytosol with abundant La protein. If the La is depleted, as shown in this example by immunoblot, cytosol from that depleted cell is about three to fourfold less efficient in packaging MIR-122 in the cell-free reaction. Now, importantly, um, it was possible to purify what appears to be a functional form of LA. So we express a tag form of the LA protein in an insect cell line, and we're able to produce milligram quantities of the protein, homogeneous, when that an aliquot of that purified protein is mixed back with the depleted LA cytoplasm, so you see now the signal is restored, that addition of recombinant LA together with depleted cytosol and membranes allowed Marima to observe a restored packaging of MIR-122 to an efficiency similar to the fully wild type reaction. Now, of course, it was possible that LA uh, was the only essential protein in the lysate required for this reaction. That seemed unlikely, and it's certainly not true, because if you do the following experiment, you, you omit the cytosol uh, and you add membranes and simply supplement the, the membranes with the single purified LA protein in ATP, here's LA present in that incubation, no sorting of MIR-122 is observed. So that's not surprising, it indicates that there are probably many other proteins in the cytosol that are required for this sorting event to occur. This will require a great deal more work to fully establish. Now, I'd like to finish at the very end with a more recent set of experiments that Marima was able to do before she completed her PhD, and that was to investigate the nature of the interaction of MIR-122 with the LA protein. Uh, we used a simple gel shift assay called EMSA, electrophoretic mobility shift assay, where one takes free RNA that's fluorescently labeled uh, and um, it migrates more rapidly in this gel. Uh, and on addition of uh, nanomolar concentrations of pure LA protein, the RNA shifts its position in the gel to one of lower mobility, reflecting a saturation binding between to form an RNP, 
complex of La and RNA. This can be readily quantified, shown in the plot here, indicating a KD for association of around five nanomolar, really a very tight association one for the other. Now, um, it's known from the literature, years of investigation on how La interacts with other RNA molecules, that it prefers to bind to the three prime end of RNAs that are terminated in a run of uridylate residues. And indeed, we know that MIR-122 has three such residues near the three prime end. And so Marima made a simple variant of this microRNA, substituting adenylate residues for uridylate residues. And this RNA, this variant RNA, is much less active in being packaged in our cell-free reaction. Note the difference between wild-type MIR-122 and the mutant MIR-122. This can be quantified. The wild-type binding curve that you saw previously reproduced here and the binding curve for variant RNA with a shift in the affinity uh, of nearly 100-fold, so a substantial difference uh, between these two uh, sites. Now, uh, it seemed possible that the three uridine residues were, were, um, uh, were sufficient, not merely necessary, but, for, but sufficient for sorting. But uh, while she was setting up to do this experiment, Marima compared the sequences of the subset of microRNAs that are highly enriched in exosomes obtained from the cell line she was using, a breast cancer cell line. And she noted that about half of those highly enriched RNAs share a five prime UGGA sequence. So perhaps that also contributes to the binding of La to this RNA. Indeed, when she made a simple variant where the five prime residues are changed while retaining the uridylate residues at the three prime end, this five prime variant similarly is inefficient in being packaged in our cell-free reaction. So that data are shown here. The binding affinity is reduced perhaps only five-fold by this five prime variant. But we believe, given these results, that the two stretches of nucleotide, both five prime and three prime, uh, contribute importantly to the sorting of this RNA. Perhaps there are two independent RNA binding sites on the La protein responsible for this sorting. And this um, re will require further exploration. Now, let me then summarize a great deal of what Marima did and uh, to show you where the lab stood now a couple of years ago. We believe that um, mammalian cells, certainly human cells, probably all cells, produce a variety of extracellular vesicles. Some of these may bud from the cell surface, such as is used by enveloped RNA viruses. Others may employ this rather more elaborate path for capture into the lumen of an endosome for secretion of RNA-containing vesicles that have a higher uh, fidelity of sorting of certain subsets of microRNAs. Now, we are exploring how these RNAs may be functionally transferred from one cell to another. We have some recent results that suggest that cells must be in intimate contact with one another to pass RNA and protein molecules from one cell to another. That will be a, a story for another day. We've also explored what may pre precede the packaging of these RNAs. We've known, we've found that uh, La, the La protein forms puncti within a cell. Um, likewise, the YBX1 protein forms RNA granules in cells, the so-called liquid-liquid uh, condensates, separate phase enriched in RNA binding proteins, which we believe may have some role in the sorting fidelity for the capture of a subset of RNAs. So these are also actively being explored in the laboratory. But let me conclude, most importantly, with the group. This is a picture of my lab team from a couple of years ago. Here I am uh, in the middle with all these much more attractive younger people and a couple of more senior sabbatical visitors. Um, the work that I've described was done um, by a many 
uh, earlier students and postdocs who've gone on to their own career. Peter Novick, whom I mentioned, um, has uh, established his own quite uh, uh, stellar research program. He is now, uh, as fate would have it, the uh, George Pilati Chair of Cell Biology at uh, UC San Diego. Uh, most recently, the work that I've discussed was conducted by Moraima Timosh Diaz, who's moved on into a local biotech company, and others uh, on the team are exploring other avenues of this extracellular traffic. Most recently, um, postdoc from China, Songyan Zhang, has discovered that cells communicate uh, proteins and RNA molecules mo most efficiently when they are in intimate cell-cell contact. So we're exploring the mechanism of that kind of transfer. Well, I've gone through a great deal of work over 40 years now, going on 45 years of my career here at UC Berkeley. I'm uh, so grateful for the having had the opportunity to uh, conduct this research with a team of really superior graduate students and postdocs and wonderful colleagues with whom I've shared many joyous experiences in my life as a professor. Thank you very much. And uh, I would welcome uh, questions if there is an opportunity in this forum to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shackman, for enlightening us about uh, your more than four decades of journey in this area. So there are a few questions. Uh, do I have your permission to take them one by one? Of course. Sure, fine. Uh, the first one is, uh, could a gene from East be incorporated into a human genome? Um, uh, yes, um, uh, I'm not sure why you'd wanna do that, but you could do that. Uh, the converse experiment has been done with great success, taking a human gene, the human equivalent gene and expressing that in yeast um, uh, to, uh, a quite an amazing discovery made now 40 years ago. If you take a gene required for progression through the cell division cycle, uh, you take the human equivalent of, of a gene, a yeast gene, and you introduce it into a yeast cell that's got a defect in its own gene of that particular gene. The human gene, if it's allowed to express itself to form the human protein in yeast, will permit that mutant yeast cell to grow and divide. That was the basis of an experiment conducted by Melanie Lee and um, uh, um, Paul Nurse uh, many years ago, which uh, uh, strengthened the notion of the unity of biology uh, uh, through, concert, through evolutionary conservation. The genes required for this elaborate pathway of cell division control and for the pathway that I've studied are fundamentally conserved over 2 billion years of evolution. Okay, fine. Uh, I'll take up the next one. Uh, what, is, what are the major challenges in uh, the cell biology area of research and any mathematical model which is available that governs the cell mechanisms? Yeah, um, the challenges uh, are now are to understand in similar detail these processes in, in humans in humans in human cells and, and in particular how they relate to disease. So for, for instance, um, pathways of vesicle traffic such as I've studied are implicated in various neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. They're human uh, mutants um, that uh, produce familial forms of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's. And some of these genes encode the very proteins that we studied in yeast. So uh, understanding what goes bad and what elements of traffic uh, contribute to the disease pathology is, is a big challenge. Um, one that is now we are fully engaged in and one which I um, organize in an international effort to understand uh, Parkinson's disease through a, a, another activity that I, haven't had time to tell you about. Okay. Uh, I'll take you, there was another part of that question, which was, can this pathway, pathway be mathematically modeled? Not by me, I'm not exactly. sufficiently math mathematically inclined to do so, but there are uh, uh, computational biologists and theoretical biologists who have 
develop quite sophisticated modelings of parts of this pathway, but the, the entire pathway is very complex and that, that the entire pathway has not yet been modeled, but certain aspects of traffic out of the endoplasmic reticulum have been mathematically modeled. Okay, uh, I'll take up the next one. Uh, how are proteins like neurotransmitter receptors trafficked to and from the membrane? Yeah. Well, um, they are trafficked by the same basic pathway involving vesicular uh, conveyance to the cell surface. Uh, they are also subject to internalization. They can be controlled and their activity, once they are delivered to the plasma membrane can also be controlled. This is a very active area of understanding the control of, of uh, trans transmission, ne neural network transmission between cells. Okay, uh, I'll take up the next one. Uh, can vesicles be tagged with proteins and can vesicular transport be affected due to viral endocytosis or exocytosis? Uh, let's see, the first part of that question was, can, can membrane... Can vesicles be tagged with proteins? Be tagged. Yeah, sure. Yes, um, this is by some in vivo tagging. Yeah, of course, uh, cells do this, but, okay. but experimenters can do this too. You can append... Uh, tags that allow the visualization of a protein to the gene for a membrane protein and, and use that to visualize a cell, visualize the membrane in a cell. Um, and uh, what was the second part of the question again? Uh, can vesicular transport be affected due to viral, viral, viral endocytosis or exocytosis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, well, coronavirus, when it infects a cell, takes over the cellular uh, apparatus. Um, it, it exploits much of the cellular machinery uh, involving the endomembrane system to elaborate itself. And uh, many such viruses uh, can, can suppress host protein synthesis in favor of the viral uh, protein synthesis. So, um, and then there are some virus, again, coronavirus, which uh, actively exploit certain host proteins to achieve its own ends. Uh, there's a, uh, an ion channel protein that is um, part of which is made encoded by the virus, but which uh, changes or subverts a host protein to, the, to serve the virus. So uh, these viruses have, um, they are, they're enormously powerful evolutionarily. We see evidence of this as the pandemic has raged and new variants appear all the time. It's yet another example of uh, the awesome power of evolution. Uh, and so viruses are cleverer than we are. They're more mobile than we are, and they can evolve to exploit any situation. It's difficult to stay one step ahead of them. Sure, completely agree with you. So I'll take up the last question. Uh, it's what's there. Uh, in what way the MIR-122 promotes the hepatitis C virus life yeah. cycle and its contribution to yeah. pathogen. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a question from, from an expert in the audience, I guess. I, I'm not personally familiar with, the, with that story, but uh, microRNAs, of course, have their own intracellular functions. And some viruses like uh, hepatitis actually uh, package microRNAs into the virus particle along with the viral genome. What MIR-122 is doing in that context, I can't say, but I do know that MIR-122 is uh, largely considered a liver-specific microRNA. And of course, the liver is, the, is the, the focus of infection by hepatitis B. So it may be that the virus, once again, has exploited this microRNA for its own purposes. It, there, there, may be, there are probably others who know more about what, what specific role it is, but I, I've said ju just a little bit that I know about that. Okay. Okay, there's just one last question, which has just popped up. Sure. Uh, then I'll then I'll close the question answer session in that case. So how are AMPA AMPA receptors trafficking modulated in PD and leads to PD pathogenesis? Uh, this I'm not familiar with. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll I, I haven't heard the connection um, between AMPA receptors and Parkinson's disease, but maybe I should go yes, look into this. Okay, okay. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shackman, for sparing your valuable time. 
and uh, so early in the morning it's it's too late i'd say it's about 10 30 pm over here so i would like to thank both the speaker as well as the attendees yes. for being there with us uh, for last one hour and on behalf of the national academy of sciences india delhi chapter this is the oldest science academy in india yeah. and uh, the host uh, institution that is the india lupadhyay college yeah. uh, the the chairperson uh, professor anurag sharma uh, who is the chairperson of the Nasi Delhi chapter and uh, the the governing body chairman and the principal and my whole team. I would like to thank you as well as all the attendees for being there with us. Thank you. My very pleasure to you and uh, and uh, I hope to meet some of you someday and when we're all able to travel. Yeah, it will it will be an honor, sir. Yeah. It will be an honor if if you if we can host your talk yeah. in person, face to face well, in India. I've, and New I've been to India several times and my wife is Indian, so... <laughs> Okay, oh, so it will be a great pleasure for us, sir. Next year, if the things are under control, we'll be more than glad to have your talk in India. Okay. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.